Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the next edition of the Holland Land Office Museum's Guest Speaker Series. Uh, in honor of St. Patrick's Day week, we have Michael McBride with us, who is going to talk about his great uncle, who he, through much research and many paths, found out uh, uh, he had a rather famous great uncle named Exile McBride, who uh, turns out was buried in Brockport. So I will let Michael take away the story and take us through how he found out about Exile McBride and his connection to this very building. So now before we go ahead, it is around St. Patrick's Day, and you know Ryan Duffy just might be a wee bit Irish. So <laughs> because he's a wee bit Irish, I got a wee bit surprised for oh, Ryan geez. Duffy. I don't know. Now, this, now come back, you come back. This is probably the most important part of the evening. So anyway, this is, uh, <laughs> this is going to give him good luck. His name is uh, Lucky the Leprechaun. All right, all right. I would go play the horses right now, and uh, there's a little Irish medallion. Oh, thank you. And and uh, next year I'll, I'll do better. I promise. This is the for this whole game. The funny thing is, I'm actually more German, but hey. hey give me that. Hey, give me that. Hold <laughs> on. Turn off the video. Turn off the video. We get, we get, we get, we get, we get, well, my name is 100% uh, Irish, so. So I'm you're the best part of your important part, so. Okay. Uh, look at there. Yes. Where do we start? Let me get a sip of water. All right, I was only kidding. He, he left. <laughs> you coming right. back? Do we wait? <laughs> Did I make a bad? Oh no, he, he has to watch the door there. Oh, he's got to watch. He's got to serve. Anyways, Mike McBride is my name. Uh, this story is beyond belief. Nobody believes it. You know, the Irish like to brag about their ancestry, especially around this time of year. You know, we have uh, relatives that are named St. Patrick and pots of gold and leprechauns, and it goes on and on, all of the learning. So what happens when you come across a, a relative that had done phenomenal things and your own family doesn't believe you? Nobody believed me. They still don't believe me. <laughs> but let me read some credentials. The, the, the credentials, are, and I'm still, the whopper is still coming in. It, it's, the pole's bent, there's a big splash in the water. I'm still bringing this big whopper in right now from four different countries, if you can believe this stuff. So let me read a couple of uh, particulars about exile here. So what would you think if I told you I discovered a great uncle through DNA, but no one in our family had ever heard of him? How's that for us break again? He went by the very strange name of Exile McBride, and there's two strikes right off the bat. People are, I really got to go, it's getting late, I'll talk to you later. Uh, talk about it, doubting Thomases. So, he was born in Ireland during the Great Famine in 1847. He lived in a one-room, mud dwelling with his parents and six siblings. He fled Ireland at 17 after a failed rebellion against a tyrannical British government. He arrived in Brockport with nothing but the clothes he was wearing. He became extremely successful in early photography. He was eventually able to finance his parents and siblings to come to Brockport. He owned an apple farm in Brockport. He served briefly in the Civil War. He invaded, nobody believes this one, he invaded Canada after the Civil War with the Irish Finians. We'll get to that. He became captured and was a prisoner. He promoted Irish independence and universal human rights for over 40 years throughout America and Europe at his own expense. By now, nobody's believing any of this. Uh, he was supported and worked with six American presidents, President Grant, President Garfield, President Arthur, President Cleveland, President Harrison, and President McKinley and Theodore Roosevelt. Who's going to believe all this stuff? And a good friend of President Theodore Roosevelt. There's nobody left at this point. I've given my family this and nobody believed. They're all, they've all gone home. He became so popular in Buffalo that newspaper headlines simply referred to him as Exile. Exile goes to Congress. Exile meets Roosevelt. Exile goes to Europe. First name only. Hundreds of articles. I have them all. 
Uh, he, he was planning a second invasion of Canada in 1884. He was kidnapped by Canadian detectives in Buffalo, but escaped. He was a victim of two serious fires. Both were considered arson. Was falsely reported as having drowned in the Charles River in Boston. Was involved in a shootout on a train. Was shot by a gang while walking down the street in Buffalo. Was almost kidnapped a second time while on board a ship. He published two separate newspapers for over 30 years. Organized national petition campaigns collecting signatures from America's most prominent citizens, including numerous presidents who supported Irish independence. Listen to this one. Despite being a wanted fugitive because he escaped Ireland, uh, he personally met three times with British Prime Minister William Gladstone and handed him these petitions of, of the signatures of Americans. And he even stayed in the Prime Minister's in his wife's own Howard Castle. Here's a, here's a fugitive who should be in a Brit British prison staying in a Prime Minister's castle. Nobody believes any of this stuff. Uh, he, he also had a considerable amount of life insurance worth $2 million today. He made national highlights when he died in 1911. According to the New York Times and Boston Globe, he was buried uh, right nearby in Brockport. And if all this is totally out in left field, uh, Axel had no grave, no gravestone, and no burial records anywhere, anywhere in Brockport. I went out there, and nobody in Brockport ever heard of this guy. By now, I feel like a complete, you know, chronic liar. So I said, this poor guy has no grave. I was probably his closest remaining relative. I'm going to put this guy back in a map. He dedicated his whole life to human rights, and he took his grave, his burial records, his stuff, everything is gone and no traces of the guy. But uh, I did find over 1,800 news articles on this guy from four countries. So I'm going to start digging in. My house is all newspapers. It's a fire trap. you got to see it. i got sprinklers on the house. <laughs> Anyways, let's get down to business here. So I, I was going to mention a fact. They say it's a lot of blarney. So I look up blarney. Deceptive or misleading talk, nonsense, Hooey. Well, that's the way I, I consider. So this is my Judge Wapner in court. I show the judge this, and hopefully they believe me. So let's get rolling. So this guy got so big over time, I, I thought, Ro Rochester, forget it. America. Actually, it's international now. So I'm doing my ancestry, never expecting anything during the pandemic. And uh, First of all, I come across a, a relative named Matthew. That's my dad's name. There's five Matthews. Uh, my great uncle was a jailbird. He, he, he jumped a 40-foot uh, wall in, in Drogheda, Ireland. And so I'm, I'm dealing with prisoners right off the bat. Uh, uh, my other uh, great uncle, James, his cow got loose in Brockport and went walked on the railroad tracks. And the results were not very well with the cow. <laughs> Now my, my other my great grandfather, my great grandfather wasn't that great. He was a horse thief in Brockport. Stephen McBride. Okay, do I want to go any further with this McBride family history? I mean, I'm going nowhere but in trouble. So, but exile started coming up. This weird name is that a lawnmower farming equipment exile. Nobody's named exile. So when I did a search on exile, I know there couldn't be anybody else but my relatives because nobody else is named exile. So the strange name kept coming up, and sort of in a nutshell, uh, John Joseph Exile McBride had been a famous human rights crusader who had settled own property and was buried in Brockport. Axel dedicated his entire life traveling throughout America and Europe, promoting his noble cause. He especially fought for Irish independence and was supported by, now I got about seven presidents, I got two more. Uh, we recently read newspapers on exile between 1880 and 1900. Now we're up to 1800 articles on them. Uh, America, Canada, and England, and Ireland. I just got more articles last week. I'm ready to go there. This is no end of the situation. This huge fish is stuck. It's a whopper. It's a whale. It's still coming in. I haven't brought it ashore yet, but this thing is big. So this is Buffalo. This is just the city of Buffalo. There's 1,500 articles on Exxon McBride between 1880 and 1911 just, just in Buffalo. So he became a household name in Buffalo. All I can think of is Josh Allen in 1900. So these are a few of the articles. I mean, it just goes on. 
and I, and I did better. I, I have pages, if you can read these, these were all exile headlines that were in Buffalo, all these different, probably 10 different papers they had going in Buffalo. I got three of these pages just regarding, not McBride, not John Joseph McBride, just plain exile. So he was well known. Uh, five thickens, he ended up having $2 million equivalent uh, of life insurance. I don't know where, what happened to any of that. Uh, so after all this, it's just a lot of malarkey around St. Patrick's Day two years ago. Nobody's believing it. Have another beer, Mike. You're making a lot of sense here. So did he also find a pot of gold under a rainbow? Did he find the leprechauns? Was he related to St. Patrick? And maybe he's a cousin? Nobody's believing it. My own family, like, he denied me and, and this guy, and they say, uh, so this is sort of like me in the boat. And I think that this was sort of appropriate. Uh, that is a whopper, and you know, this is a conspiracy. And so the old saying, if it sounds too good to be true, you know what? It probably is. This is where I'm coming from. So I gotta dig in. I mean, this poor guy should be on the map. He gave his whole life for human rights and dignity, and they took his grave and his burial records and his stone, and who knows where they went. But I just felt really obligated. So I'm going through old records of you know the old cigar boxes in the attic, looking for possible exile pictures. Uh, that might be him. I'm thinking up in the top there because exile is on the right. And is that the same guy? Maybe, maybe not. In a court of law, certainly couldn't prove it. But I'm trying to. Uh, connect the dots. Uh, is that guy actually an old family picture from who knows when? Is that the same guy? I don't know for sure, maybe. But this was a breakthrough. Lillian McBride was my aunt who lived in Leroy. I know for a fact she was a great aunt. There's no question there. So when she died as a teenager at 19, it was a big story in the Buffalo Times. Why is the Buffalo Times covering a big story on Lillian McBride? Why? because it was a niece of Exxon McBride. So there's the link. And then more articles in Buffalo, death of Miss Lillian McBride, niece of Exile. So this is my link. Another article because he was, she, he, he had, she had a famous great uncle and it was all over the Buffalo newspaper. So this was exciting. Whoever this guy is, I live in Rochester. I, uh, I got out to Brockport in about two minutes. I broke a few speed limits. but. I expected to see in Brockport a gigantic bronze statue of Exxon McBride. You know, he's going to be all over the place, a big monument. And uh, when I got there, there's no grave. So by any credibility I might have had at this point is 20 below zero. So I, I kind of thought of that TV show, Unsolved Mysteries. So Brockport, uh, the secretary said we have no records of him. Nothing we can do to help you. You should go to uh, Mount Olivet Cemetery in Buffalo. He's probably going to be there. And I felt that obligation. As, and my great uncle, he dedicated his whole life for human rights, and, and, and he, there's nothing showing he ever even existed. So I started going through old cemeteries with my sister. That's an abandoned cemetery. It was right out of a Halloween movie. <coughs> I went there. This is what I'm dealing with, trying to find a stone. It, it was like a junkyard of, of, of uh, gravestones. There's one McBride there, but nobody I have ever heard of. So I'm going nowhere, it's a needle in a haystack. I'm going nowhere in a hurry on this. So I checked out, uh, what, six cemeteries, nothing on Exxon McBride, nothing. I said, you know what, this is a waste of time. What am I doing? So I, I took out a full page ad in the West Side News. Any information on Exxon McBride, I got all kind of leads, uh, but nothing really great. But the, Tim, the Timothy Church, the cemetery owner, the church that ran the cemetery called me. They found this old burial book in 1911. And as you can see, I had it open the pages because they were going to like break apart my hand. And there's the entry. It's hard to read, but the date lines up. Uh, the estate of, of, of John McBride, exile of Aaron, and it... Uh, Mrs. Stephen McBride, that's my great uh, grandmother. So that's what I need. But remember, don't forget, Session H, that's going to be really important coming up. So I, I translated it. That's pretty much what I just said. Everything lines up. That's his grave. Not all of the cemetery is where he was buried. 
So it was all over the news two years ago. This, we found this Irish freedom fighter around St. Patrick's Day. Got a lot of news coverage. Uh, there's another story. Uh, the Democratic Chronicle. The Buffalo News came to the cemetery. So it's all over the place. This guy is not someplace in Ireland or New York City or California. He's right down the street in Brockport. So Section H. I go to Section H. You see all the stones? It's pretty much been gutted out. They got rid of the stones. So this one fellow from Grand Island, uh, outside of Buffalo, heard about this. He said, I'm going to bring my ground, I spell probing, it's very penetrating. He brought this machine, it's like a lawnmower with a computer. He scanned the whole area going back and forth. The density of the dirt and the density of the stone are very much different. And the stones jump right out. As you can see, this is in Buffalo. I met him one time. He's digging up these, these stones that had settled in the ground, and the ground kind of ate them up. And he's finding all these old stones. This thing is very accurate. There's one he dug up. They're about 10 inches down. They're 100 years old. And the stones are actually preserved. They're really neat. This one had fallen down, and the ground grew right over it over time. So he, he, went, he came to Brockport. He, was, he, came, he volunteered to service this. And he said, that whole section, uh, what happened with these old cemeteries, they become so old and dilapidated that to fix one's going to cost maybe $100, $200. If you got 100 stones, there's no money in the budget to fix all these old stones. And what they were doing years ago is they were bulldozing them. I, I was shocked. Wow. Uh, they lost it. I said, yeah, he said, well, they make sure no relatives are left. They're old enough so their relatives and the immediate family are no longer around and nobody visits them, so we kind of pull those. But with the DNA and the ancestry, people are coming along and saying, like, where's, my, where's my Aunt Sally? And, and they're finding these cemeteries and the, the graves are all gone. So I call the whole man or a real a grave man or a real cover up. You like that? So we had a dedication, and we got that stone. I, I got a great, a beautiful stone from McGee Monument. He was so mad that the, the, uh, the stone company, I got that for half price. And it's the only stone out there now. It's pretty much, uh, they said it's going to be forever wild because our records were so bad. So I kind of own the whole section H. It's kind of like McBride Park out there now. But I, I'm going to sit, can I sit now? Oh, you're very, I better not sit down. I better. Yeah. Oh, no, you're fine. Actually, I'm focusing okay. on the screen. So, just a little, little bit of a commercial. During St. Patrick, every year during St. Patrick's Day, everybody's having a good time. And I, I just learned a lot myself of exile that the poor Irish had some tremendous hardships. You had the potato famine and, and uh, the British, they had no rights and a million deaths from the famine. And uh, a lot of that's been forgotten over the years. So, I learned a lot by doing exile's history. So he was born in Drogheda in 1847. That's the old city where he was born. He lived in a little small tiny hut, a mud hut with uh, six siblings and two parents, if you can believe that. And they would bring animals in when it got cold. It was totally poor hygiene, a lot of starvation, just terrible conditions. And back then, uh, in the 1880s, they had no rights. They had no, you know, no, no rights to own land. They were starving to death because they had no rights. They couldn't grow crops. Discrimination, no free speech. It goes on and on. No fair trials. Uh, so a million deaths during the potato famine. And I found an old article from 1847 describing the famine. It was horrendous. Uh, interestingly, Exile was baptized. I'm going to cap a guy in. I spelled baptized wrong. But anyways. Uh, he was baptized in this church at the same church on the side altar as a famous Irish martyr, uh, Oliver Plunkett. I, I didn't know any of this stuff. It's really interesting. He was beheaded for saying a mass, a mass probably in the 1850s, and his head is actually on a, on a, on a display in there. He gave his whole life. Uh, he, was, he was beheaded for practicing his faith. Just unthinkable uh, violations of human rights. And this might have affected exile early on, uh, knowing this bishop was beheaded for pregnant for saying a mass. So I think early on he, he was it, it, the human rights violations really got to got to exile. Uh, that he was a fellow who was beheaded. So in 17 in 1864, John Joseph McBride fled Ireland to avoid persecution. He had been involved in a failed rebellion against the ruling tyrannical British government. He exiled to America, settling in Brockport, 
This was the origin of his nickname, Axel. He took this passenger ship. Can you imagine taking that across the ocean today and the wind changes? Hope you're not in a hurry. So he, he went up to Erie Canal. Uh, I found it interesting that he would, of all the places in America, he went to, uh, to Brockport. But then I realized uh, a lot of the Irish built the er Irish, uh, the early uh, Erie Canal, a lot of the Irish built it, and they stayed behind after they finished it. And he had a relative living in Brockport who probably had him stay with him initially when he first came to Brockport. He had an apple farm in Brockport, I found that out. Uh, 1907, Salmon Creek Road. Actually, it's part of Northampton Park, but I went in late at night, put the sign up so that just to get a picture of where it was. This is where his land was when he was here. Uh, there are the few apples. They look like they're radioactive, don't they? But they don't look very healthy. He had a 63rd birthday. I got articles all over the place on Salmon Creek Road. He got into early photography. This is really interesting. I think because he was close to Kodak, and back in 1870, 1880, you get a picture, a camera, that was a, like a miracle, a picture of a house or a person or, or a tree on a flower. That was really amazing. And he made a lot of money with photography. So that brought his family from Ireland to Rockport, the money he raised in photography. Uh, and that's an old baptismal record. So that's John Joseph Exile, and my great-grandfather is below that, Stephen. So who knows what the Battle of Ridgeway is? Anybody? I never, I never heard of it. I never heard of it. I, I had no idea. Now, we got Ridgeway Avenue in Rochester. It's a bad neighborhood. I figured they had a, a riot with a bunch of gangs fighting each other at the Battle of Ridgeway. <laughs> the Battle of Ridgeway was in 1866. The, the Civil War was over. The Civil War was completed, and the Irish, the, the, actually, they were fighting each other, the Union and the Yankees. They look back, the war's over our, our whole land. They're starving to death. They had no food. What are we going to do? We're desperate. We're going to attack the British Commonwealth, Canada. Hold Canada. Talk about a couple of Guinnesses. We're going to hold Canada hostage until England gets out of Ireland. It, it was just so desperate. It was so desperate. Uh, but they did. That's what happened. And it was all over the news. I never knew any of this stuff. The Finian War, U.S. troops, I mean, the United States was to declare a war in Canada, the Irish were. So President Jackson had a fit. Right there they are in the green, uh, right across the river from Buffalo. And the U.S. Navy <laughs> picked up the Irishmen and <laughs> put them on that prison barge. So Axel, I don't know which one is him, but he's on that barge somewhere. <laughs> And actually, I, I, got the, I got his prison record from Louisville, Kentucky, believe it or not. Uh, John Joseph McBride, who lived in Buffalo at the time, these guys that listened to prisoners, he was one of them. And they were released on parole afterwards, but uh, it, was so, it was so desperate. I mean, they didn't stop anything from changing. They just, hundreds of them crossed over, and it, not, it was a huge fizzle. I mean, they were just so desperate. Their families were starving to death back home. It was sad. Uh, but this Axel, he was all over the news. So in 1883, they were going to execute this one guy. Axel got wind of it and said, if this happens again, we're going back in Canada and clean house. So he was a, he was a feisty great uncle, I tell you that. And they did kill him. He was going to go back, and, they, and they, guess what happened? They kidnapped Axel McBride. <laughs> they kidnapped the Canadian detectives. So this is this is the I think a great uh, adventure uh, movie or a book. I'm working on a book right now. I'm just about done, by the way. So he got kidnapped in Buffalo, coming out of uh, uh, Joe Schmidt's saloon late at night. And then and then after the Battle of Ridgeway, 1866, he was a go-to guy for the Battle of Ridgeway. They would always quote Axel McBride. Years after Ridgeway, there's 1890. Uh, Axel McBride was carrying a flag. They always 1899. He got arrested. He got involved in a shootout on a Canadian train. I mean, the guy, and, and then the Battle of Ridgeway again, he's, they're quoting him, Axel McBride, 1905. 1906 again, Battle of Ridgeway, who did, who did they go to, Axel McBride? So I went up there, uh, visiting the battlefield, right across from Buffalo. There's where they had their battle. So, a couple years ago, that it was getting on the news that this Mike McBride came across this great uncle. 
and they said, can you give a talk about the Baylor Ridgeway? I said, the Baylor Ridgeway? I don't I know nothing about the Baylor Ridgeway. Well, you must. That's your great uncle. You must know all about it. And these guys had the muskets and the guns, and they were ready to go back into Canada. I said, well, if I, if I say something wrong, you know, I don't want to get shot at, you know. So I went up there. Uh, I had to give a talk at 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning. I missed my turn. The Canadian Peace Bridge is right around the corner. And I, I said, the GPS gave me a wrong reading. I'm on the Canadian Peace Bridge going across the bridge. Canada's closed because of the pandemic. This gigantic, I think he paid for the bills, this gigantic security guard comes out. Sir, you see that big sign? Canada closed because of the pandemic. You see that sign there? What are you doing here? Well, I couldn't say I'm coming across because my great uncle invaded Canada in 1866. And I'm going to reenact it or something. I said, we've got a family reunion. I just want to stop by and see how things are going. And he said, get, get out of here. So look, I just got back in time for the talk. There's me at the end. A few of them. Yeah, these guys were going to start shooting. Believe me, they were ready to roll. And, and I got some more news coverage there. So after the Battle of Ridgeway, for the next 40 years, uh, working with seven American presidents now, He's traveled the whole country and Europe promoting Irish independence and universal human rights. Why was it important for Rexel to gain American support in working to achieve Irish independence against a tyrannical British government? England was dependent on American trade for both importing and exporting products. Rexel knew that many government officials in America opposed England's tyrannical control of Ireland. They were also many Americans of Irish descent who deeply despised England's cruel treatment of Ireland. Akshal realized that America could exert great influence in expressing their disapproval through raising tariffs and applying trade restrictions. So for many years, he made numerous headlines collecting signatures from America's most prominent citizens who supported Irish independence. That was known as Irish Home Rule, having independence in Ireland. So he traveled the country collecting signatures. This went on for, he went to Ireland uh, three times, but he had six different petitions over the course of like 10 years. And I got there to St. Louis. He traveled the whole country collecting the signatures. And he would give the Prime Minister Gladstone, the British Prime Minister, hand deliver. So this goes on. These articles are just all over the place. I couldn't believe it. So if you have 50,000 names here, uh, petitions, actually, he, he took the petitions to England, not Ireland. Because Gladstone was the Prime Minister of England. So, uh, Again, the famous Ashton McBride, he, he's got these petition books. Uh, again, thousands of prominent Americans signed a petition simply for Ireland. Uh, uh, home rule, everybody supported this guy. He's just, he can't go to this country with a shirt on his back, and now he's like a rock star. Uh, the governor's signature, uh, Noble Meadow signed it. It, it. it goes on, President Harrison signed it, Vice President. Morton signed his signature. Homo for it actually prints a book of his autographs. And this went on forever. There's an old copy of one of the books, it's pretty bad, but I got, I got this out of Villanova University. So there's a page of one of the petitions. They must have typed them up, but he had 15,000 of these over the course of time. So he met three times with Prime Minister of Gladstone. Happy looking guy, isn't he? Yeah. So imagine crossing a boat. This is pretty interesting here. That, now they're not taking sailboats, they got the, uh, the steam engines. This particular boat was docked in Liverpool uh, and the Titanic was coming out. And, and it, it, the Titanic almost dinged into that. It almost had a huge collision. The Titanic had the wake. What do you call it, the mooring when they're tied to a... The Titanic caused the wake. The wake broke the, this ship loose and it was going right in front of the Titanic. And if they ever hit, that would have been a serious collision, a lot of, probably months of repair, and perhaps the Titanic later in the year might not have hit any icebergs, who knows, just a, just a theory. So, exile, now here's a, here's a Irish, here's a fugitive that should be in jail in a British penal colony in Australia. He should be in it for high treason. How in the world is this guy beating Prime Minister Gladstone? This, this is work that's really, like Alice in Wonderland. It's, it's just unbelievable. Uh, Gladstone was known as the Grand Old Man because he lived to be close to 100. It just goes on and on. There's stories all over the country. 
I saw McBride, McBride to Gladstone. He used to negotiate with Prime Minister Gladstone to get the British out of Ireland. How could this ever be? If, if I had a couple of articles, but it's just over and over and over. I mean, there's no, there's no doubt. This, this really blew me away. Now, here's a fugitive who should be in a prison in Australia. He's in Prime Minister Gladstone's castle. You can't make this stuff up. And that's pretty much what I just said. He, he, he should not, he should be in jail, not in a Prime Minister's castle. So it just goes, the correspondence with the Prime Minister just goes on and on. He's thanking the dignitaries that gave him signatures to hand deliver to Gladstone. Uh, I found this interesting book that was in Prime Minister Gladstone's autobiography, and Exile is in the book, giving him petitions. Hmm. A lot of newspaper articles, uh, not, not so much Exile, but formally, uh, uh, Irish, I'm living in Buffalo, the Derbyshire, whatever that is, uh, Derbyshire on England, uh, Westminster, whatever these papers are, well-known Irishmen in America. It just, I cannot believe the articles I'm getting out of England on this guy. Amazing, isn't it? This is all English. So after uh, Prime Minister Gladstone died, he, he got in contact with other leaders. He's just was become friends with other British leaders. So I don't know how he did it. He must have get some Blarney Stone or something. But now he's not with King George, and that's another friend. Uh, this. Prime Minister Rosebery, uh, Excel's friend. How did he do it? I have no idea how this happened. Another <laughs> Prime Minister. Uh, and that's another Prime Minister. And all these Prime Ministers, and then he, he addressed a, uh, the British uh, ambassador. So this is interesting here. He became very well known for selling political badges. Uh, if you put a picture in 1880 of a house or a person or a tree, on a piece of paper. So wearing badges was, was kind of really prestigious. And he would put president's pictures during elections on the on these photo badges, which seems pretty trite and, you know, not nothing exciting today, but back then, wow, you're wearing a picture of a presidential candidate. That's kind of, kind of special. Uh, I found this old stationery that he had from Buffalo, uh, photographs, badges, and half tones. And he had a gallery in Buffalo. I mean, the guy was amazing. This particular uh, Ezekiel McMichael was a head of, prominent uh, Buffalo photographer. He was head of the, of the whole country of Photographic Society of America. He was head of it. Him and Exile like owned all the photography in Buffalo in 1900. This is one of the. I got this on eBay. One of the Theodore Roosevelt badges. Uh, that's one of Exile's. He got to know these presidents, in this case, Roosevelt, after the Spanish-American War. He got in with Roosevelt early on and just watched him climb up. And he supported him all the way uh, to the White House. And again, he became very good friends. The man for Roosevelt badges, he was selling tons of them. Uh -uh, there's a McKinley badge, he was making notes. Now they're calling him the badge man. <laughs> Uh, he made 5,000 photos of President Harrison and of Vice President Morton. Thousands of pictures of, of uh, Governor Cleveland. See, he's getting, he gets in with these presidential candidates early on. Now he's working with Cleveland. Uh, when President Garfield uh, died, he put this big, actually, J.G. McBride, he put this big article in the Buffalo paper. I found that. Uh, he was in the St. Patrick's Day Parade in 1876 selling Handsome ribbons uh, of, of St. Patrick for 15 cents, what a deal. He published two newspapers uh, for years, not only for Irish independence, but universal human rights. Uh, and I got a copy recently, believe it or not, look into that. This is the way the paper looked. And he uses pictures of a picture bird, a novel back then, because there weren't the newspapers yet. The technology wasn't there. So I got a call from a guy in Buffalo, an old footlocker, they found this ancient newspaper, and my uh, great, I got a closer picture. Uh, there he is, my great uncle, J. John J. McBride, publisher. 
So he called them, they called them proclamations, and he, they were so successful, newspapers would advertise his proclamations coming out where they were buying them. They were free. So this guy had a lot of money. Now, he stepped on a lot of toes because the British didn't get along with him, and anybody that was not pro-Ireland that during elections, he'd say, don't vote for him. So he did have, this is just a random shot, he did have his mother's house burned down with, with an arson late at night, and also his photo studio. So that was total. So he actually marched the presidential inaugural parade. I thought that was pretty neat. Actually, I will help inauguration. That was President Harrison. President Taft, he was in his, his parade, uh, inaugural. President McKinley. How did this guy ever do this? It's amazing. Uh, that's, he was normally walking behind a presidential carriage. Uh, one of those guys might be him, I really can't say for sure, but that's how, how it was set up back in those days. <clears throat> so presidents and dignitaries. A good friend of Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, he's, he mentioned in this article later on with Roosevelt. Uh, there's, a letter, Rose, there's a letter from Roosevelt from XL John J. McBride, 1899 or something, Theodore Roosevelt. And they went back and forth, this constant correspondence. A very good friend with President McKinley. Some, some kid called President McKinley a mug. Anybody know what a mug is? Must have been a bad word back in the, those days because of Axel had him arrested. <laughs> uh, this is really interesting, and it's a tragic event. Uh, he had gone to the 1901 Buffalo Exhibition, and he was, he was assassinated. Axel, as in later in the article, I'll show you that. Axel McBride mentioned in this, uh, they were going to lynch the assassin, and Axel McBride came out. There he is there. Uh, he was also president and gave some timely advice to the crowd to refrain from deeds of violence. So he was in a, in, in a front page story there. Oxal and McKinley had a special friendship. Uh, this is really interesting, what's coming up. The series of events. In uh, August 29, 1901, Oxal telegraphs President and Mrs. McKinley asking if they want, uh, they'll be back in Buffalo September 5th. They went to, they went to a special newspaper edition of the president visiting the exhibition. Uh, a few days later, uh, Axel sends Mrs. McKinley a gift. It was a souvenir he purchased the, at the exhibition. Uh, ironically called a pillow of peace. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, shortly after President McKinley was shot at the ex exhibition, and then we covered the point where the angry, angry mob tried to lynch him and Axel McBride got involved. Uh, he died about a week after that. This is, this is what Axel sent to Mrs. McKinley. I got this in the newspaper. A loving and loyal people rejoice in the restoration to health and pray for long, continuous. May peace and comfort always attend you. A, a peace pillow in exile, and, and his, her husband gets shot at the same time. Another good friend, uh, Benjamin Harrison. Uh, there's, a, there's part of the story that he, he had, I don't know when he signed it, the petitions, Irish Home Rule. Harrison was a real supporter. Prominent Democrats who said they would vote for Harrison, there's exile. He, he, was, he had property in Rochester to go back and forth the farm. So he's listed as a Rochester uh, address in this particular article in 1892. Grover Cleveland, another good friend. Uh, exile meets with President Cleveland. Uh, same story, President Taft. Axel cuts out some work for the president in. And the, so, constant uh, presidential support. Uh, high ranking member of the Catholic Church was Cardinal Gibbons. Axel would see him all the time. Uh, here's a picture of the Pope. There's Cardinal, uh, uh, Bishop Timon of Buffalo, big supporter of Axel, who was an immigrant from Ireland. So uh, this, the articles just seem to go on all day. It, it's just, and I'm, st and I'm still finding a lot more. I mean, look at these articles.
So he, 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 he won an award at Albany, uh, like, like a human rights award. He, he won a lot of different awards. We'll get to that. So these are different pictures of him. This is probably the last picture before he died. So when he died, it was a big, big story in the newspaper, headlines all over the country. I thought this was pretty neat from Elmira, that he gave up a fight, he fought for human rights, he gave his whole life passionately fighting for human rights and dignity. He gave it everything he had, he couldn't do any more. And uh, yeah, here he ends his career. So he never saw Irish independence. Uh, he missed by five years. He died in 1911. The proclamation of Irish, uh, the Republic Proclamation of 1916 was five years later. So they're telling me he's not in Brockport. I got all, all these articles buried <laughs> in Brockport. Oh, he's not here. He's not here. No, of course not. At his funeral, he got, he was, uh, he had a big funeral at, uh, St. Joseph's Cathedral in Buffalo. He was brought back to Clinton Street in Brockport. Uh, the, the post office is there now, laid out at his brother's house, my great grandfather's house. That's where the house would have been, the post office is there. He had a second funeral in Brockport at the Tiffany Church. Uh, I got an old legal statement from a lawyer uh, as, part, as part of the uh, settlement. He must not have been, been a very good lawyer because the lawyer spelled McBride wrong. He just got J.J. Bride, so I wouldn't have paid him $30. So five years after Exile's death, his lifelong passion for Irish independence finally became a reality. Similar to our Declaration of Independence, the 1916 Proclamation of, of, Irish, of the Irish Republic was signed. Axel had definitely contributed to this document. It contained all the basic human rights that he had struggled to achieve for over 40 years. There's a copy of the so-called Declaration of Independence, a lot like ours. Uh, Axel was called the uh, uh, Ireland's Liberty Bell. It is Axel McBride's particular function, like the end of the Liberty Bell, to proclaim freedom and liberty unto the land and to all the inhabitants thereof. Uh, he was like, I call him a renaissance man. He was up to his neck in a million things. He was a photographer, newspaper, publisher, lobbyist, diplomat, negotiator, organizer, orator, political badge distributor, Finian, prisoner, apple farmer, Irish freedom fighter, and universal human rights crusader. Axel always promoted universal human rights. For years, he published thousands of copies of the Declaration of Independence and sent them to, to oppressive governments. He, he did it in 10 different languages, the Declaration of Independence. He was given numerous awards for his lifelong struggle for fighting for human rights. This is a little bit of my house. It's, it's, it's just all newspapers now. You can't get in the front door. Uh, his family members, Exile, never, never had a wife or children. His parents and most of his siblings remained in Brockport. Uh, his mother, Jane King McBride, and sister are buried in Section H. They found that out. His father, uh, Matthew, was in a Patrick or in the Bannon Cemetery in St. Mary's. Uh, Axel's brother Stephen, my great grandfather, is laid to rest at St. Francis <coughs> Cemetery in Leroy. Uh, we had a dedication about a couple of years ago. There's a few of our McBrides. There's a stone we had. Uh, more news coverage. As you can, it, it'll be the only stone there. There's one old stone in the corner, but there's probably a 200 square, 200 by 200 area. This is about this is the only stone except for that one because the records are so bad. They're going to keep it forever a while. We had a, a display at the Seymour Library in Brockport last year. Just some paraphernalia articles we, we put together. Uh, we, I donated that, that picture of Exile to the library. It's on the wall. So, this is, the Minstrel Boy, is that a song people have heard of the Minstrel Boy? It was his favorite. So, I'm going to play his favorite song and read a couple of quotations.
John Joseph McBride was modest, kind, unassuming, and entirely devoted to the cause of Irish nationalism. He was ever ready to travel any distance to perform any labor and to give his time and money. He was loved by those who knew him. Axel J.J. McBride has traveled at his own expense all over the United States and secured the signatures of the most prominent citizens of the country. He will use these to address Prime Minister Gladstone in promoting Irish home rule. No Irishman, either in America or Ireland, during the last 30 years, he has done more for the cause of Irish independence than Axel McBride. Night or day, he has always answered his country's call. His love for his mother country and his desire for her freedom from English rule led McBride to become one of the most ardent advocates of freedom for Ireland. May Axel McBride and his lifelong struggle for human rights, especially in Ireland, never be forgotten. Six siblings, all but one came to Brockport. They all came here when they had nothing. They were starving to death. Uh, my great, my great, great grandfather died. Uh, had a sunstroke. He died of tooth decay back then. Some sure. things or things you would never die of. And then he got involved in a battle on Ridgeway. Who would believe a bunch of Irish would declare a war in Canada? And then Ryan gave me that book. And, oh, I should have bought that. I'll bring it back. This is the craziest thing. This, what do you call those books where they're, they're using a fictitious name or a fictitious setting? Well, but it's historical fiction. Historical fiction. So he's in this book. He's got uh, John Jay or something. It, it's, everything matches, but they didn't want to really use his full name. And he was describing how all these Irish people, they're watching, their, people, their families are dying back home with a famine and disease and they couldn't, they had land, they couldn't grow crops. The British were actually taking 
food that they were growing on the Irish land and, and, and shipping it elsewhere. And, and so they kept, the Civil War was over, a lot of them still had weapons and guns and, and they said, you know what, we're, we're going to attack Canada. I mean, it sounds so desperate, but they were very desperate. And they beat, they, the Battle of Ridgeway, they won the Battle of Ridgeway, but President Jackson got wind of it, and, we, and did we get a neutrality uh, agreement with Canada? So he put the, he, he stopped, there were, there were like 5,000 troops in Buffalo, this, this, this huge ship, uh, our, our with the cannons is, is, a, is a Niagara, Niagara River blocking anybody else coming, coming across. And without reinforcements, General O'Neill had a retreat. And then the boats picking up all the Finians that went to Canada, and I got arrested. What a pathetic ending, right? So, and then he stayed in Buffalo, and he made money in photography, but he traveled for years. And I'm getting articles, like I said, about uh, this country, all, a lot of articles in Canada, too, and Ireland, and, and a lot of it, a lot in England. He was a rock star. Visiting Prime Minister Gladstone, how do you do that? How do you do that? So, you can, you can, my family doesn't believe it, but you, you can see why there's doubting Thomases because it's so, they, they're doing a lot better. <laughs> but initially, you know, it, it, it's just surreal. How in the world could this happen? So I've given 16 talks so far. Uh, and, well, this time of year, I'm a leprechaun also this time of year, but it seems to not work. But, Either you're calling me on the phone, but any of the leprechaun or actually I'm a cry. Which which one do you call for today? <laughs> so I go into nursing homes as a as a leprechaun and I just make, put a smile on people's faces. So any questions? Anybody have any are you totally confused? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm a fan of Westerns and there's a good um, uh, Camp Gunwell Channel has a good account. It's not really, you know, it's not historical, mm -hmm. it's made up or whatever, but it still follows fairly accurate, which seems to be a fairly accurate opinion of the movie. Really? Yeah, character with no, what, what is it? What, what, what is it? So, uh, Have Gun Will Travel is a Western that was made back in the 1960s. Oh, they actually had that particular... Yeah, yeah. They there's covered that? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, they did. Interesting. Right. You know, the, the Western is really good back in the 50s and 60s. It's oh, good. Gun Smoke and John Gun Smoke, right, right. Yeah. And Have Gun Will Travel is one. I remember seeing that on a tiny little bit. It was about this freedom fighter, you know, and so forth. So it was, it's not what I can, you imagine, can you imagine, I'm giving a talk on the Finian. I thought Finian was like a skin disease. I don't know what Finian were. Mm -hmm. And these guys stayed their guns, and I said, uh, and I'm, I'm in Canada, I'm talking to the security guard, I made the wrong turn, so. It's been really interesting. And like I said, this, this whopper, it's not in. I'm still bringing this thing in. <laughs> and it's gonna be big, and I mean, I'm still, so it's been really interesting. Now, i got to mention uh, the German guy over here, Duffy, on how that could be out there right now. So, my great-grandfather got charged with stealing a horse, right? So, I am trying to find his house, but he, he took the horse to Bergen. So, I'm in Bergen, looking for anything dealing with McBride. Uh, Mike McBride's my name. i got a great-grandfather, Stephen McBride. Does he have a house someplace in Bergen? So, this guy gave me... Duffy's business card. I, I'm not even sure. So I, I, I go, I, I'm, I'm going through this, and it says, Axel McBride dedicates Holland, where am I going to land, and where, how I land, what is it, museum, in 1894. I said, this guy was all over the place. Yeah. And, and, I, and I showed, I, I showed uh, to Brian, I said, what are you talking about? And I pulled the article out, and there it is, 1894, Axel McBride again. So. There's no telling what else is out there, I, you know, it just, it's really been crazy. And, and uh, I'll get more articles from, from St. Patrick's Day, someone else will hear about it. So it's been really, it's been a very interesting. How somebody kind of got, so, somebody this big, that worked with six American, no, seven American presidents, the Prime Minister Gladstone, how he was that big and got so lost. It, it's amazing, isn't it? How that could happen, but it did, so. But what are great nephews for but to run the button down and figure out what that happened? <laughs> Put them back in the map. So, so I, I got to tell you this the cemetery was a little ticked off because uh, I wasn't supposed to know that the, the burial, that his, his remains were in that cemetery because they got rid of the, all the stones. It's an embarrassment for them. Major. 
And I got, I got so much, I got, you know, you want to go to Buffalo, we have no records. We looked, we checked, go over. And, and, and they were so, uh, it was so obvious, it was so suspicious that I said, I got to get to the bottom of this. I brought in a ground penetrating radar and said, there's nothing here. I, 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 they cleaned out the whole section. Yeah. So I get a copy of the burial records. I'm surprised I let me see it because if I didn't see it, I couldn't have done anything. And as, as Mr. Stephen McBride paid for the, the plot $6 in 1911. So they told me, well, if you want to put another stone in, it's going to cost you $700 to put another stone. $700, you see this record here, Mrs. Stephen McBride, my great friend? She paid $6 to solve the game for already. Uh, <laughs> totally right. embarrassed. Totally embarrassed. But can you imagine trying to pull that? They want to keep me out of there in the worst way. I said, they don't like it, that weighs 800 pounds, you can go pick it up and take it someplace where the other. They told me the stones were in an old barn. They said they both those the stones, and they were, they, they were reverent to the stones. <laughs> they piled them up in a barn. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Are there state laws related to all that? I call lawyers, I call forensic labs, I was going to do DNA. And they said, it, it, it's so old, you really can't do much with it. Uh, I, I, I'm lucky I got the stone in. They didn't want that stone in there because now people are going, you're, you're going to Section H. Well, what happened to Section H? You, you got a new stone in. They didn't want to tell anybody the truth that they eliminated the whole section. Yeah. And this guy from Niagara Falls or Grand Island said, these old cemeteries, after a while, they just blow those. So no one's around to check up on them. Right. And with, the, with, with DNA now and Ancestry, they're finding Aunt Sally in this old cemetery and they're going there. What's going on here? Nothing left. So, really interesting. You, you see them along 104, these old cemeteries with some of the, the stones, some of them are marble. And they, the names have sort of like right, disappeared right. because marble is soft in the right. environment. And they were Civil War, you know, maybe some of them. And, uh, but I was told, I was in the, I used to sell monuments for a while. Oh, you did? And they, they said that if those uh, cemeteries uh, are, not used anymore. Uh, usually, the villages or towns are required by law to take those over and maintain them, and not just let that happen. I don't think they enforce it too That's much. That's what I was told. Yeah, I don't think they really enforce it because uh, my great grandfather's in an abandoned cemetery, and they both those had too. The Clarkson right next to Brockport, they, they knocked them all down, and they put a lot of the stones. They put this berm up, and they leaned all the <coughs> stones were left against the berm. So, I mean, it's just really shoddy, isn't it? Mm -hmm. you, have no, you have no recourse. All you do is get another stone and try to shame them, shame them, embarrass them. I know. That's a beautiful monument you, you got. What, oh, you said they charged you only half of that? Uh, that's great. They wanted like five to grand, I got it for 2,500. Yes, that's a good value. Well, he was a man. He said, what, you, you mean to say he gave his whole life for human rights and dignity and respect? And, and, and they took his grave away. Now, how low could he get? <laughs> so, he said, I went to pay the guy one day, the second, you know, 52 cents down, and I went to pay him, and he wouldn't take the money. Oh, he said, this is, this is shameless. <laughs> so, anyways. So, it's been really interesting. I mean, I can't, I don't know what's going to happen next, so thanks for coming. Thank you. The story that nobody believes, and it's just, how in the world could a guy have done this much and been so lost, you know? So, anyways. Thank you again, Michael, for yeah. that story. I like the I like the vent. I could talk all night about this guy. <laughs> uh, I went over the budget, the time. No, you're good. You're good. I kiss the Lord. He's going to your it's all right. Uh, so just a quick announcement about upcoming things. Uh, this week's a very busy week. We've got trivia on Thursday, and on our Women's History Month, it's on famous women, and I worked in a lot of local women. So come and check that out at seven o'clock, and then. We're, so we started St. Patrick's Day tonight. We're going to end it on Friday night with No Blarney, a two-hour concert. Uh, so come and check that out. They always put on a great show. It's from 7 to 9. Uh, so come and enjoy all the Irish drinking songs you could think of and uh, have a good time. And then uh, we have a big event coming up. Uh, May, or March 23rd is uh, Murder Mystery Dinner Theater at the Tavia Country Club. Uh, it's a 1920s themed. Uh, and we work in a solar eclipse even. So, and I would be remiss if I didn't show off our new merch for the eclipse. Oh, look at that. <laughs> so, 
You can get your uh, 98 years since the sun went out t-shirt. It's the only, it's one of a kind, you won't find it anywhere else. Right. And who's the guy with the sunglasses? Who is he? That's Joseph Ellicott. So if even Joseph Ellicott's getting in on the... Uh, <laughs> I couldn't tell with the glasses. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, so thank you guys. Uh, okay, and well. uh, have a good night. And we'll see you the next time. Right, thanks, man. Thank, thank you. Thanks.